What do you mean when you say AIDS is a lifestyle disease? Well, I, I would not say that now. I, I may have at one time. Um, I need to qualify it. Uh, basically, my, my view on AIDS has, has changed, but I have regarded it for a long time as a phony construct, meaning that there really is no such thing as AIDS. It, it's not a coherent disease entity. Um, all we really have are diagnoses of various kinds, which have uh, changed a great deal. But originally the question was why a few gay men, a very tiny subset of gay men, were getting sick in ways that were called AIDS. This would be back in the early 80s. Uh, and I thought that I could perhaps help there because I had been a gay activist since 1969. And I also had uh, expertise as a survey researcher. So I read all of the literature on AIDS. And at that time, there were many hypotheses. But it looked most reasonable to me to expect that some sort of drug, toxins, were what were causing it. Because AIDS was not then and never has behaved in any way like an infectious disease. And there were certain drugs which were almost peculiar to the a certain subset of the gay lifestyle, uh, the main one being poppers, which uh, for some reason was almost never used at all by straight men, but was used very heavily by gay men. Well, originally poppers were amyl nitride, a prescription drug, which was used for emergency relief of heart pain. Uh, and they were used primarily by elderly people with heart problems, and then only in case of an emergency. But a very few gay men, mostly those in the, the, the leather scene, started using them. Uh, they found that they enhanced orgasm, basically. Uh, but then after Stonewall, after 1969, there was a uh, explosion of gay industries of all kinds. Yeah. Poppers, uh, an industry developed around them, which actually made it you know, $50 billion a year or more. Uh, instead of the old poppers, which were little ampules, they were glass and they were popped with the fingers under the nose, uh, they were in little bottles. And they were uh, other forms of nitrites, but all very similar, called the alkyl nitrites. They would be butyl or isobutyl or some other form of nitrite. Uh, they had similar effects. Uh, but at any rate, it occurred to me that this might be one thing that was leading gay men to become sick in ways um, that they were. It was just a guess. But I started working with Hank Wilson in California, and uh, I discovered there was a very extensive medical literature on uh, the, the volatile nitrites. Uh, they are very, very bad indeed for the health. In fact, I should probably describe what they, they do, the toxicities. The simplest thing is that they're very powerful oxidizing agents, which is, is bad. Uh, poppers cause severe anemia, in fact, several types of anemia. Uh, and secondly, power, poppers are, are powerfully mutagenic, meaning that they cause cellular changes. And, and this is bad news because substances uh, that are mutagenic uh, are almost also uh, carcinogenic. So at any rate, um, Hank Wilson and I tried to you know, get the word out to gay men. Uh, we had a hard time because gay publications were all running, you know, every issue, uh, a dozen ads for poppers. This was a large part of their revenue. And uh, there were only, you know, a few gay publications that would even print a letter from Hank or me, you know, let alone an article. But eventually, we, we published our little book, uh, Death Rush, Poppers and AIDS. Uh, and the word started to get out. Uh, they're still readily available, but I think that not nearly so many gay men use poppers now as used to. The studies, if you looked at them, uh, yes, and true, there were, there were none of the early AIDS cases who had not used poppers. But I, I've done my own independent research, which I describe in the AIDS war. Uh, one of my informants, Artie Felsen, who was very, very active and outgoing in the, the People with AIDS Coalition, uh, 
claimed that he had interviewed several hundred you know, gay men with AIDS, and he said that virtually all of them had been heavy users of drugs. But he said, without a single exception, they had all been uh, paupers users. Now, in 1983, the CDC announced that they had done studies which showed that paupers were safe. Yes, you? there was some like that. that utterly fraudulent. Uh, more fraudulent in the conception, really, than the execution. But they, again, assumed that paupers were used as remotorizers. And when you have such a totally dishonest uh, assumption to begin with, everything else that falls will be, you know, equally uh, fraudulent. Uh, with any poison, uh, the dose is important. I mean, I, we could drink cyanide if it were a very, very, very diluted dose, and it, it might even be good for us. But, uh, you know, again, with any poison, uh, the dose is important. And no, the, the doses of the mice we're exposed to, you know, might not have been one, one thousandth what gay men would get in, in the course of a single evening. In my position from the very beginning, from my first major AIDS article in 1985, was that toxicology was the answer rather than uh, microbes and infectious agents. Uh, in the case of intravenous drug users, I've analyzed this in considerable detail in my book, uh, my articles in the AIDS war. But it's very clear that they are getting sick from the drugs themselves, and furthermore, they're getting sick in exactly the same ways they were getting sick a hundred years ago. Uh, for example, uh, among the opiates, heroin and so on, uh, one of the leading things is uh, pneumonia and tuberculosis, lung problems. And this is perfectly obvious because uh, heroin not only wrecks the immune system, but also it suppresses lung function which is why codeine is used in, in cough syrup, or it used to be. Um, so the question is, you know, with all of the emphasis on clean needles, to take the very simplest of all things, and as a survey researcher, I would tend to think of, you know, the, the simplest thing should be done first. Did they or did they not share needles? And um, I asked all of the public health people I could. I called Washington, I talked to them in New York, they all seem to think there was a study showing that they shared needles, and yet, in fact, there never was one. Uh, there have been studies since then, quite a few, not on whether they shared needles, but on whether those who used clean needles uh, came down with diagnoses of either HIV positive or AIDS. Uh, and some of those showed that the rate is far higher among those who used the clean needles. In other words, somebody who injected heroin always using clean needles. Some of the studies, they were much more likely to be HIV positive, which indicates clearly that whatever it is that the so-called you know, HIV tests are measuring, uh, it has nothing to do with a real virus. Uh, whatever causes the antigens in the body that the, the test in one way or another measures, uh, they have a lot to do with things like drugs and other stuff, and past infections, and probably nothing at all to do with a, a new virus. As far as what the government policy should be toward drugs, uh, I don't know. I mean, I think the present policy uh, is about as bad as it could be. But um, certainly they should be told the truth. So it's not fine and dandy to uh, inject heroin with a clean needle. And um, the same could be said about all of the other gay drugs. Um, the emphasis of the public health service has always been that sex is the most dangerous thing, that sex is the cause of HIV infection, all of which there's no proof for, but that all of the other stuff, that you should only worry about intoxicating drugs because they might for make you forget about safe sex. In other words, um, if you were schwacked out of your mind on some sort of drug, you might for forget to use condoms. Well, in fact, <laughs> all the evidence we have is that the drugs are what make people sick uh, in ways that were called AIDS, and that sex itself is, uh, 
I would say I, I don't know of any study that even shows that sex per se is a risk factor. Now, this would involve using certain types of statistical analysis, multivariate analysis and, and other types, uh, to isolate the various variables to show how much each one of them contributes. Uh, and, and that's a whole other thing which gets rather technical. From the very beginning, you know, all of the efforts of the, uh, the government public health service were determined that it should be an infectious agent long before they came up with one. Uh, at a certain point, of course, things go on to a different level and you have the, the, the enormous investment of the medical industries and also of all of the various researches with the reputations at stake. You know, you think how devastating it would be if the truth about AIDS came out. And the truth, of course, is that there really is no such thing as AIDS, as a disease entity. And secondly, that um, HIV, if it exists at all, and I, I think it's rather doubtful that it does, um, is not causing illness at all, let alone, you know, AIDS. And third, that the, the drugs used, the uh, you know, HIV drugs are, are killing people. So if there have been half a million people in the U United States, whatever it is now, that means virtually half a million of people that were killed by drug toxicities. So all of that, uh, it's not too surprising when you think of all of the reputations of thousands of people, when you think of billions of dollars uh, not only that the, the drug companies and other industries would not have, but lawsuits, you know, it, it'd be quite catastrophic uh, if the truth ever came out. To comment on the very earliest AIDS cases, uh, there was a certain, a great deal of dishonesty in the very beginning in the way they were reported. For example, they described the first not just the first five, but say the first few dozen uh, AIDS cases as being young and previously healthy. And this was not true. Uh, the average AIDS of the first few dozen AIDS cases was 38, uh, which is a lot younger than I am. But on the other hand, it's not, you know, it's not really young. Someone who's 38 years old has had enough time 10, 15 years, exposed to a uh, highly toxic, well, I don't know the word lifestyle, including to many toxic, harmful, things harmful to the health, uh, for them to become sick in one way or another. Uh, secondly, they were not previously healthy. Uh, the data have been re-examined of the early AIDS cases, and hardly a single one of them, but had been really quite sick for a long time. Some of them were congenitally sick. They had been sick for their entire life. Um, but they, you know, to, to say previously healthy is a grossly misleading term. And again, this is not an accident. Paul Fulberding, one of the leading so-called AIDS experts, um, reported on one who had been, you know, deathly sick all of his life, and yet he referred to them as though giving the impression that he'd been perfectly healthy before he came down with what was called AIDS from the first uh, so-called case control, I'm sorry, case control study. Uh, they gave the impression that the only important thing was what they called promiscuity. Uh, and they, even though they showed that uh, the guys with AIDS diagnoses had used an enormous amount of drugs, uh, they considered that irrelevant because the so-called cases with AIDS and the so-called controls, they couldn't find a statistical difference. Well, in fact, the people they cons used as controls uh, were, you know, pretty sick cookies, and many of them came down with AIDS later. Yeah, it was a grossly uh, inappropriate study design. But even here we get, an, again, it's not that they had good intentions but made a few mistakes. It, it's clear dishonesty. For sex, they used um, the mean, the arithmetic mean. So if you had someone with a uh, 1,000 sexual partners per year and someone with one sexual partner per year or zero, 
you would get an arithmetic mean of, you know, like 500. But this is grossly misleading. I mean, you have to show in statistics the whole distribution and you have to show measurements of what's called dispersion and various other things. But you don't just simply pop out one figure, the mean, and, and let it go at that, which is what they did. Was the approval of AZT based on high-quality clinical trials? No, certainly not. Oh, I, I went through, you know, probably several hundred pages of documents released under the Freedom of Information Act of the, what were called the Phase two trials. And the Phase two trials are supposed to show that a drug is both safe and effective. And it became clear that there was not all sorts of sloppiness there. But at one point, they had freely admitted that they had used drug data. They had used data that they knew were false. So I'm a professional researcher. I know immediately that this means fraud. You cannot use data that you know are false without committing fraud. But the question of how the fraud was done, uh, I had a hypothesis, you know, which turned out fairly well to be correct. But they claimed that there, these very startling differences in mortality in only a, shy, a short time period, um, I forget what the figure was, uh, 19, I think, people uh, in the placebo group died and only, what, one on ACT died. Uh, this is utterly impossible considering that all of the other aspects of the study showed no benefits whatever to ACT. I mean, that would be a true miracle. Uh, well, there, there's a lot to go into it. I, I, I've anal analyzed um, the study pretty thoroughly, and um, I think that what I wrote is available on the internet now. Um, it gets kind of technical because I'm analyzing survey research, which, which indeed the trials were. But I eventually found um, there was a study uh, investigating the Boston group at Mass General Hospital where the FDA investigators found blatant fraud and issued a report on it. And they, they um, recommended that all the data from the center be excluded from the study. Uh, it turned out the FDA used all of this data, all of which was total garbage, fraudulent. Uh, and they used the um, justification that it wouldn't change the results much, which, it be, you know, right here you know that you're dealing with um, criminal fraud. You know, anyone who could use a, a rationalization like that. But I fought for many months to get a, a copy of that report. Uh, I would not have gotten, I got the runaround, you know, yes we have it, no we don't have it, it's here, no it's there, it's disappeared, there's no such thing. I got all sorts of contradictory answers. But I found something which is highly unusual. I found one single honest woman in the, the FDA and she went to bat for me. And uh, there were even at some point there would be a conference call where I would be on the line and she would be on the line and some FDA officer would be on the line. And she said, now I would like you to hear what she has to say. And this woman would claim, you know, that, that there was no such thing was lost, whatever. But finally I did find it, and it was, uh, it was quite something. I mean, it explained very concretely the most incredible type of cheating that took place in Boston. Um, well, I can go in detail, but in, anyway, in my book, the, the AIDS War, I have a chapter on this describing, you know, all of the, the details of what was found. Well, it was by no means a, a double-blind placebo control because almost immediately, uh, patients and doctors both knew who was getting what. But this pales in the insignificance with the other types of frauds that were there. But since you're on it, let me say that I spoke to Margaret Fischel, the, the primary author, at length, and I recorded it. Uh, I didn't tell her I was recording it, and perhaps I should, but I, I regarded something of this importance, where lives are at stake, that you can bend things a bit. But the, the woman was, you strike that, Margaret Fischel could not answer my simplest questions about the study. She could not explain tables there, she could not explain statements that she herself allegedly had written. 
She just kept saying over and over that if I wanted answers to my questions, I should call Burroughs Welcome. And who was Margaret Fischel? Margaret Fischel was the leading investigator of the Phase II trials. She was the primary author in the New England Journal uh, article. The, the, the study fell apart. I mean, it bombed in so many ways. Uh, I, I showed the article, I, uh, I wrote on it to my colleagues in survey research, and they were absolutely struck down. They could not believe the levels of incompetence that were there at all different levels, including things that are purely mechanical, but like the, the ability to design a, an appropriate questionnaire form. Um, but yes, of course, um, a, a drug which is supposed to be given for the rest of somebody's life, if you have something tested for only a few weeks, so uh, you have a very poor idea of you know, what to expect from it. In, in, especially the Boston study, they would claim someone was in much longer than, than uh, was claimed on the, the, the case report forms. And this meant that simply the doctors uh, received a great deal more money. But far more important than this was the uh, reporting of the adverse effects, the toxicities. And th th this was, you know, the heart of what the study was to measure, that it was safe. And there were, many of their patients were, would have died from the toxicities of ACT if they had not been given emergency blood transfusions. This is serious um, adverse effect. It means literally that, that they would have died from the poison. And yet the case report forms, which showed up eventually as official data, um, they would report no adverse effects. I mean, this is a type of dishonesty, it's hard to go any further than that. Almost immediately, I knew that it was fraudulent, and I thought how stupid these people are. If you're going to commit fraud, do so more subtly. Uh, and of course, eventually I found out, you know, all types of fraud, and there's probably more than I did find out. This wow. is a different take, but to me it was the stupidity of, of the crooks that they couldn't even put up a convincing statistical front there. And how come the 19 people in the placebo died versus the only one AZT patient died? Well, this is, this is a fiction. <laughs> I mean, I can't explain something that's not true. Well, the most outrageous case, I forget which one it was, but it was someone who had already been taking AZT, which a few people could. You know, they wanted the new miracle drug and they were able to get it before it was approved for marketing. And he was entered as a, a patient in the placebo group. Even though he was still taking ACT, uh, he dropped out almost immediately, but continued to take ACT, and then he died. And they called him a, a death in the placebo group. I mean, it's, it's hard to cheat any more than that. Of those who were given ACT, uh, they all suffered really severe side effects. Side effects is misleading, toxicities. But um, a number of them would, would very definitely have died from anemia, which uh, in the, the review of animal studies, uh, ACT causes anemia in every species of animal that's ever been studied, including human beings. But th they would have died if they'd not been given emergency blood transfusions. And yet, according to the official data, the case report forms, these people had no adverse you know, reactions. The, the one single most unforgivable thing, uh, I mean, there was cheating. There's no reason to believe that Boston, one of 12 centers, was the only one in which cheating took place. It's very likely that the same cheating, maybe even worse, took place in all 11 others. It's just that Boston happened to get an honest investigative team that did their work. Uh, Many of the others were going to be investigated thoroughly, and then they said, oh, we just don't have time. So we don't know. Um, but to me, the single worst thing is that they deliberately used data they knew were false. This, you know, that, that's the one single thing that can never be forgiven. As with poppers, you know, you go immediately to what is the chemical property of it. And with poppers, they're powerful oxidizing agent and a powerful mutagen. A case of ACT, it has a very simple effect. It, it purely and simply, it 
um, terminates DNA synthesis uh, in ways that Peter can explain to you. I mean, it substitutes itself for one of the four building blocks of DNA and therefore breaks the chain, therefore uh, essentially terminates the life process. Uh, this was considered a good idea as a cancer drug. Uh, since you know, DNA synthesis is involved in growing things, uh, and since cancer grows uh, abnormally fast, if you had something that uh, terminated DNA synthesis, maybe this could kill a cancer before it killed a patient. You know, good idea. That's the, the uh, rationale behind chemotherapy. Well, it didn't work that way. In fact, um, not only was ACT worthless uh, in preventing cancer or in treating cancer, but in fact it caused it. Iatrogenic means um, caused, an illness caused by medicine, medical practice, or by doctors. Uh, with regard to AIDS, uh, yeah, it's, there are many iatrogenic phenomena. Uh, certainly the, the AIDS drugs, not only ACT, but all of the ones after that, including very much the protease inhibitors and all of the other nucleoside analogs, uh, are harmful, and they, uh, the AIDS drugs, probably since the late 80s, are the, the number one cause of so-called AIDS. But there are also much more subtly uh, iatrogenic effects going on. Uh, I would say, for example, psychologically. Uh, I think the devastating psychological uh, effect of getting a positive result on an HIV test is almost enough to kill some people. And certainly it, it's driven them to suicide. People have been murdered because they had a positive thing. They've been driven into bankruptcy. And I imagine a lot of them just got, you know, deathly sick because of, among other than they were told they should. Plus the fact, of course, it, it led many of them to being treated with uh, anti-HIV drugs. But there, there are so many different things. I mean, um, almost all of the AIDS phenomenon is in a sense iatrogenic. AIDS, you know, once, once more is a phony construct, but in the early days, the very early AIDS cases were really quite sick. And there, there were very good reasons why they were sick, mostly drugs, but not entirely. Some, you know, had been born sick. But then at a certain point when Really, when that sort of AIDS had virtually ceased to exist, there became a new type of AIDS. They expanded the definition, and also they began giving the, the anti-HIV drugs to people who were, in fact, not even sick, but merely positive on the HIV tests. Uh, and in that case, uh, of course, I mean, uh, when they finally became sick enough from the AIDS drugs, then they were called AIDS patients. But here in Massachusetts, this is interesting, um, in Massachusetts, the number one leading cause of death among people who are HIV positive is liver failure. And I don't think liver failure qualifies yet as an AIDS-defining disease. But these people are not, they're not counted as AIDS cases. They're just somebody who was HIV positive given AIDS drugs, and the AIDS drugs killed their liver and they died. Hmm. Looking back, you know, over 25 years, um, I think I'm probably the longest running AIDS dissident. Um, you know, this began my, I began in earnest, well, actually in about 1981, but, you know, in earnest in 1983. And my first major AIDS article was in 1985. So I was, you know, two years ahead of Duisburg. And I'm still, I am involved in other things now, uh, primarily um, English literature, the English dramatic poets. But I haven't, you know, by any means disengaged <coughs> myself. Um, but it, it's hard, you know. Um, I guess I would simply have to say that my main concern is the, the gay men who have been murdered. Uh, and I don't think murder is too strong at all. I mean, when you have drugs like ACT that were approved on the basis of fraud, and which, you know, I don't think murder is too strong a word to use when you have a drug like ACT and, and all of the nucleoside analogs that followed, you know, more or less on its coattail. Um, 
approved on the basis of fraudulent research and where, as you know, Joseph Sonneman said, AZT is incompatible with life. Well, if it's incompatible with life, it's a poison. And if it's a poison that kills people, uh, in context like that, it's murder. Um, it's not easy. Uh, I think that AIDS is winding down in a way partly because it's simply become boring. Uh, any effort which goes on constantly to try to drum up still more interest in the latest breakthrough, which of course never is, uh, nobody cares anymore. You know, I want to go on to, to other things. Uh, yeah, one thing I forgot to mention on HIV testing. Uh, why have so many gay men tested positive on these things? And Christine Johnson has shown that there are 50 or 60 different conditions that can cause a positive result in the tests. Anything from past infections with, say, influenza, malaria, drug abuse of all different types, extreme stress, alcoholism, pregnancy, uh, all kinds of things which have nothing whatever to do with viruses. But one possible hypothesis is that something in gay men is causing them to register positive. That, that's conceivable. And something like uh, Popper's recreational drugs is at least a hypothesis. But another thing which is very important is that uh, gay men have been targeted for testing. In other words, uh, the general population of the United States, there has never been the mass pressure, get tested, take an HIV test. But gay men, the propaganda there is everywhere. And so, of course, the more people you have taking the test, the more positives you will get. And to me, this is, is a very sinister development or very sinister uh, phenomenon. Some people are very fortunate that they don't have these side effects. What's the point of finding causes in each other? So what seems to be the same as the vaccine cause?